Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. I am Danielle aka Stitcherista here on YouTube and today is going to actually be a diamond paint with me. While I continue working on Treasure Studios Art Cherry Blossom by Lizzie Falcon, decided to shake things up a bit and do diamond painting today. So, yesterday's arbitration, it was the first day since we've been doing this arbitration. We are now in the third week. It, it, no, we're in the second week. Yeah. Um, it is the first day since we started that I haven't felt like I was dying at the end of the day. So... We had a new backup person that we tried out, and she did fantastic, so thank God. Thank God, let me tell you, because you just don't even know how much that is going to alleviate everyone. Um, I actually had little snippets, little pockets of breaks throughout the day, which I normally did not have, and um, yeah. So I caught up last night with Nine Perfect Strangers. A new episode was on there. Oh my God, if you are not watching that show, holy hell. And I texted Jill and she said there's only two more episodes left. And I'm like, no, but yeah. And then tonight I'll be able to watch um, this week's American Horror Story. So I was able to get done work yesterday at 7 or like 5 after 7, which is pretty good. Um, cause I was getting done work like seven thirty, eight o'clock. I still felt like I saw Bill for like two minutes. Um, cause by the time I heated up my dinner and got downstairs, it was like seven twenty, almost seven thirty. Um, but he's actually off work tomorrow. He is going to Maple Grove, Pennsylvania for, there's some kind of car race that they go to every year. He goes with his friend. So... He took off work tomorrow and he'll be gone all day. I mean, he'll be gone till probably like 11 o'clock midnight. So my plan, I'm going to get sushi. I'm going to door dash sushi for dinner tomorrow. Because even if I get done at 7, I'll still have a couple of hours probably where I'll be able to diamond paint or stitch or, you know, just to, just to relax. And it's the weekend, thank God. So, yeah, that is the plan for the next two days. And I'm trying to think, is there anything else? I'm still reading Survive the Night by Riley Sager. I have to say, I'm not like gaga over it. I am going to read it. I'm almost halfway through. I'm I'm probably on page like 150, something like that. It is getting better. Um. And I'll probably read everything he ever writes because I absolutely love all of his books. But this one, I'm just, maybe something fantastic is going to, I don't know. It got great reviews. Um, so, and his last book, I remember, it took a little bit for me to get into it. Usually I don't give books this much time. I'm doing it because it's him, but... Um, there are, I have so many samples on my Kindle. There are so many books out there that have come out, you know, this month, past couple months that I want to read that, um, yeah. But yeah, I'm hoping, I mean, it hasn't been cooler weather here yet, but I'm hoping that now we are into September that the weather is not, there aren't going to be any more 90 degree days. I don't think there's going to be that. Um, see, my thought is this. As soon as September 1st hits, it needs to be like 65. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, but every, uh, the kids all started school um, on Tuesday. Back to school in person. But yeah, so that is what is happening in my neck of the woods here. Like I said, not much going on. Um, the arbitration takes up a large, large part of my day. And Bill came home yesterday and we had some issues. I mean, we, it, it, I think it's going to be rare for us to go through the day 
and not have any issues. You know what I mean? So we had some and I was a bit frazzled when he had come in and he was like, how was your day? And I said, typical day, because typical day means, yeah, typical day. And that's all I really said. Um, I did say, because remember I told you guys yesterday that my boss had said they're starting at 9, but then they got the confirmation and said 8.30, and I'm like, but they always say it's 8.30, even though it's not. And she was like, well, they could have changed their mind. We were all sitting here for half an hour, because at 8.30 Central, she messaged me and said, oh, yeah, you're right. They're starting at 9. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I sat here and got some stuff done, or I think I read. I did something. Fine. Able to, like, kind of get myself prepared for the day. Because once we get started, we're good. Like, we're in the routine. And they pretty much stop at 530 Central, which is good. So, at least I can sort of count on that. Because yesterday they were done by 630 my time. And we kind of have a routine now in the evening after the job is over. So I was able to be done by 7. So I'm hoping that going forward, that can happen. We will see. But okay, today's story is another unexplained, unsolved mystery. And it is called Close to Home. Situated just 20 miles north of Colorado Springs, Woodland Park is a quaint, tranquil community of some seven. 7,500 souls set within the stunning surrounds of the Pike National Forest and with majestic Pikes Peak as its backdrop. Known as the City in the Clouds, it is a popular weekend destination for Colorado Springs residents wanting a mountain getaway. It also serves as a bedroom community for its neighboring metropole. What the hell is a bedroom community? Let's see. Let me try to Nah, it's not going to take it because if I click on it, it's just going to say bedroom. I know what a bedroom is, dum-dums. Okay. It was the place that the Maddox family called home, and for 18-year-old outdoors enthusiast Joshua, it was a little slice of heaven, and I'm guessing it would be, yeah. Josh's parents were divorced, and he lived here with his dad, Mike, and his sisters, Kate and Ruth. He was somewhat of a free spirit a long-haired guitar player who enjoyed writing and spending time in nature. He also did well at school and was a deep thinker, always willing to challenge preconceived ideas. Josh also had a mischievous side and was known to be a bit of a prankster. Once during a high school recital, he donned a robe and joined the choir on stage, miming along to the words. That must have been quite the spectacle then, right? But Josh's life had not always been this carefree. In 2006, it had been touched by tragedy. That was when his 18-year-old brother, Zachary, lost a long-standing battle with depression and took his own life. Josh, Josh was just two years younger than Zach, and the brothers had been close. He was deeply affected by his death. That's awful. However, as we all must do in the face of loss, he adjusted, adapted, by 2008, he was back to his old self, teasing his sisters by telling them that he was going to disappear one day on a big adventure and that they would not hear from him for a long while. Hmm, foreshadowing? Probably. On the evening of Thursday, May 8th, 2008, Josh told his sister Kate that he was going out for a walk. This was something he did quite often, sometimes carrying his guitar or journal with him to a quiet spot where he could play some songs or scribble down some ideas. On this occasion, he took neither, telling Kate that he would be back soon. Kate took that to mean 20 minutes, maybe a half hour. She wasn't unduly concerned when an hour passed without Josh's return. Soon is a subjective word, but when two hours passed and then three without any sign of Josh, Kate did begin to worry. Yeah, you would, right? Eventually, she alerted her dad, and Mike Maddox then got on the phone to Josh's friends, and none of them had seen him or heard from him. Hmm. Now Mike had a decision to make, right? Should he alert the authorities? And what were they likely to say? That teenagers wander off all the time and that they usually return under their own steam. 
Besides, hadn't Josh always hinted that he would disappear one day on his big adventure? Was this it? He wouldn't have not taken anything, though. He didn't take anything, remember? Had his son walked away, heading for pastures new. Mike dreaded that idea, but he also knew that Josh could not have gotten far, not without money or even a change of clothes, which is what I just said, yeah. And so Mike decided not to call the police, but to conduct his own search. This probably wasn't the smart move. Over the next five days, five days, he visited homeless shelters, drove to campsites in the area, checked in again and again with Josh's friends until they were sick of hearing from him. And eventually on March 13th, he reported Josh missing. A search was then launched for Josh, one that began in the town proper and spreading out into the surrounding wilderness. It was impossible, of course, for the police to search the entirety of the vast Pike National Forest, but they didn't need to do that because Josh could not have gone far. The searchers did a thorough job of combing the tracks of woodland surrounding the town, and they didn't find a trace of Josh. Eventually, the search was abandoned. I mean, yeah, after you do so much, eventually they're going to stop. The consensus at that time was that Josh had probably hitched a ride out of town. Seven years pass. Jesus. Seven years? Seven years passed during which there was no sign of Josh, no word, no respite for the family. During that time, Mike kept up the search for his son, making regular inquiries visiting shelters in Colorado Springs and further afield, even scanning the faces of strangers on the street, hoping against hope that he might spot his now adult son. Because remember, he was 18, so now he's like 25. All of those efforts went unrewarded. Meanwhile, back in Woodland Park, a construction project was underway just a couple of blocks from the Maddox residence. Oh boy. Chuck Murphy was a long-term resident of the town and owned a decrepit old cabin that his family had acquired back in the 1950s. Before that acquisition, the cabin had housed the Thunderhead Branch, a notorious watering hole known for its raucous parties and illicit gambling. Chuck's brother had lived in the cabin for a time, but he had moved out in 2005, and thereafter it had been used for storage. By the time that Chuck decided to pull it down in 2015, it was a crumbling structure, damp, moldy, rotting on its foundations. Demolition of the cabin, and we know what's coming, right? We know what's coming. We've read enough of these stories. Demolition of the cabin began on August 16th when a bulldozer was brought in to tear down the chimney stack, the most solid piece of architecture in the whole decaying mess. This would turn out to be a traumatic experience for the workers involved. As they moved in to clear the pile of bricks brought down by the excavator, they uncovered a mummified human body that had been wedged inside the chimney, curled into a fetal position. What? The work site was then immediately shut down and the police were called. Subsequently, the body was removed to the morgue where dental records would confirm its identity, and it was Josh. All these years, he had been just a couple of blocks from home. How the fuck did he get in the chimney, though? The autopsy performed on Josh's body would reveal the terrible details of his death. He had died slowly, succumbing either to hypothermia or dehydration. The corpse bore no obvious signs of trauma, no bullet holes, no stab wounds, no broken bones. There was also no evidence of drugs in the system. According to the coroner's report, this had been a terrible accident. The teenager, so Josh, standing over six foot and weighing in at 150 pounds, had probably tried to enter the cabin via the chimney and become wedged inside. His efforts to free himself had seen him contorted into the fetal posture and more firmly lodged than ever, and with no one nearby to hear his calls for help, he had died a lonely, agonizing death. Jesus Can you imagine, like, that would have been so horrific because you would know you were going to die. And he probably screamed until he lost his voice. And then, God, I can't even imagine the the pain that he went through. So it was a neat explanation 
but it's probably not going to be the only one because there's still some story left here. It was a neat explanation, one that ticked all the boxes and allowed the case to be declared officially closed. The only problem was that it could not possibly be true. Hmm. According to Chuck Murphy, it would have been impossible for anyone to climb down the chimney because he had installed a grid of rebar up there to keep out critters. So the only way that Josh could have entered the chimney was from below. How do you fucking stick someone up in a chimney? Interesting. But even that explanation does not gel with the evidence. Josh was found wearing only a light thermal shirt. The rest of his clothing had been neatly folded and placed on the floor. So he was only wearing a shirt? No pants? No nothing? What? Additionally, a heavy breakfast bar had been dragged across the room and positioned in front of the fireplace. Even if we accept that Josh had, for whatever reason, decided to remove his clothes on a chilly May evening and then to scurry up a chimney in an abandoned cabin, who moved the breakfast bar? I'm just... There was obviously somebody else involved in this. Chuck Murphy said that it wasn't him, and the construction workers are equally insistent that the bar was where they had found it. So who did this then? Could it have been someone who wanted to prevent Josh from escaping the chimney? Oh, so it might have covered the hole, like the opening. Oh my. So outside of the official channels in Woodland Park, you would be hard-pressed to find anyone who believes that Josh's death was an accident. The prevailing theory is that someone was inside the cabin with Josh, and then that person forced him to strip and then climb up the chimney. How do you climb up a chimney? Is there stuff inside of it that you can climb up it? This individual then dragged the breakfast bar in front of the fireplace and left, abandoning Josh to a terrible fate. So who might have done such a thing? The name most frequently mentioned is that of Andrew Richard Newman. Mm. Andrew Newman was a classmate of Josh at Woodland Park High School. A skinny, dorky kid described by his peers as a hippie, Andy Newman was hardly the most popular kid on campus. However, he played guitar in a local band, and that was perhaps what attracted Josh to him. The two weren't exactly bosom buddies, but Andy had once told another friend that he and Josh were planning a trip to Mexico. Josh, of course, would never make that trip because he didn't graduate, but Andy did. He quit town after graduation, but not before boasting, according to one witness, that he had put Josh Maddox in a hole. Why, though? Why, right? So Newman would rack up quite an arrest record after he left Woodland Park, accumulating warrants in six different states on charges from assaulting a police officer to disorderly intoxication, grand theft, and battery. He would also become a suspect in a murder. In 2009, Newman was in New Mexico living with a friend named James Walito. Walito was taking care of an elderly disabled man at the time. One morning, Walito got out of the shower and found his companion stabbed to death and Newman nowhere to be found. What? This is such a strange story. A few months later, Newman was arrested in Oklahoma after police received complaints about a vagrant knocking on doors asking for food. He was taken into custody and fingerprinted, at which time the police learned that he was wanted for murder in New Mexico and for burglary in Washington state. Questioned about the New Mexico stabbing, Newman started talking instead about another murder, saying that he had killed a woman in Taos and stuffed her body into a barrel. The police, who already had another man in custody for that killing, did not believe him, and Newman was subsequently confined to a mental institution. What the fuck? So, it should be clearly stated that there is not a shred of forensic evidence linking Andy Newman to the death of Josh Maddox. Certainly, the authorities can find no reason to investigate Newman as a suspect, and why should they? Josh didn't die as the result of a homicide. He died in an accident because that's what it says on his death certificate. I just, that is such a strange story. So obviously there was someone involved though, obviously. And if it was this Andy person, was he just off his rocker? Like why would, I'm so, wow. I kind of like these unexplained ones, but I kind of don't because I like a resolution to the stories. 
Yeah. Okay. Well, that was highly unsatisfying. <laughs> But had you, have you guys ever heard of these cases? Like, I've never heard of any of these. So, remember, look for something positive in each day, even if some days you have to look a little harder. As always, if you have any questions, please leave them in the comments section below, and I will answer them to the best of my ability. Thank you so much for watching and subscribing. And I will see you in my next video. Bye, guys.